Well, good evening. It's, uh, it's time to start. Let's start with our theme chorus. Let's stand as we sing this together. It's number uh, 380 in your hymnal if you're using that. <clears throat> All right, everybody in. Here we go. I am looking to Jesus, giving all in the race, pressing upward to gain the heavenly prize. Faithful men are my witness who have struggled and died. To watch from the midst and in the scars. Faithful men have come before us. standing please uh, we would like to sing number 504 oh say but I'm glad all right there is a song in my heart lift your hand. I think most of you have those. We'll get those to you. Let me have you add a couple of items there uh, in addition to a couple that I'll highlight. Carol Mood ha has some serious medical needs and was um, happy to have us put um, her on the prayer list. Marilyn Olson is doing much better. A couple ladies were over there last night. Bert and Judy Kyle have just been wonderful help, as was, uh, so, as were so many people on Sunday, and she's very appreciative of uh, everyone's help and concern. Um, someone is out to see Larry Turner last night. S marginal improvement, slow, persistent pain in his tongue, also needing to get an injured shoulder looked at, so pray for him. And then various updates here. Um, Verity is making progress little by little. Uh, Lynette Van Vlack, surgery is going well. Pray for Bob Sutton, Nancy Hurst, and right down, on down through the list. One I would have you add is Lee Williams. She, f about three or four weeks ago, she fell, fractured the top of her humerus. That's the shoulder area. And so she's in a sling, so be praying. For her, if you would, and happy to report that uh, uh, the Needhams are back in Cameroon, and they are there. Um, and their next step is to get the airplane one hour north to Bafusam, get those extra fuel tanks out of there so somebody else can ride and uh, give an oil change and just uh, kind of look it over a little bit. And so uh, they are uh, there. Just thanking the Lord. What a good, good step forward that is. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for that airplane getting to Cameroon. We, we know there have been many helped with this tool, 
in years past, and we just ask you again to be especially with them and uh, the ministry there, be with those continuing to learn French, and to be with um, those hosting just a number of young people um, in, in uh, just living with them. And uh, Lord, pray for Brother Swanson, the Needham son-in-law, that he's He's recovering from a very serious illness and making some progress there. He's back in Cameroon teaching Bible Institute, but surely, Lord, we know he's having to pace himself, ask that you to help him. Lord, we do pray for these we mentioned already. Be with our service tonight. Thank you for these good songs we can sing together. Be with Lee Williams as she's recovering from uh, this uh, fractured bone and uh, just help her. Uh, we thank you in Jesus' name. Number 460 in your hymnal is He Leadeth Me. Let's sing this together. Item or two to add to your prayer list, if you would. It's good to have um, Ruth's sister-in-law, Maria Mixer, here. Had surgery, and we want to keep praying for you. And then uh, the Burleys are uh, traveling by vehicle.
Colorado and back over the next about a week, I guess, so pray for them as they travel. I want to read just an excerpt or two before the announcements, if I could, from uh, missionary prayer letters. Um, numbers of times our missionaries come in on you folks and the interest that you show, um, the concern, the help, uh, so grateful for the prayer. Uh, so uh, from the Reardons, who are now stateside in furlough, but this came in right before they left on furlough. He, he wrote this. We had something this week that has never happened before. The tracts we give out have a place on the back where if the recipient gets saved, he can write his name and address. A man named Socrates took a picture of the track with his information on it and sent it to my phone through WhatsApp. I talked to him. Plans to come to church this Sunday. So that was that was pretty interesting. And then from also from the Reardon family, they have someone uh, helping them while they're stateside continue on the work, and they're thanking the Lord for uh, 12 students in the Bible Institute uh, this year. The Reformers Unanimous Addictions Program, uh, seeing visitors, and then from the Smiths in. Um, in Estonia, um, they write this. We have a number of folks ready to be, to be baptized, and selecting an ideal location is always difficult. We finally gave up last month and ordered a baptistry. Can't see it from here, but he writes, some looking at it would say it looks like a kiddie pool. And it's, it's, it's kind of a rectangle. Um, looking thing, but it is a baptistry, so they haven't received it yet. He writes, um, we hope to get the baptistry up and running while the weather's still warm. It is currently in the 90s. Now, backing up, he said, we had blistering hot weather at the beginning of the summer, and then it got down to almost 40 in July, so he said it's been an odd summer, but he said, he said, uh, we baptized Russians, Lithuanians, and Estonians in water that was very cold in the past. But a number of our folks that have started coming in the last two years are from equatorial Africa and neighboring countries like Cameroon, Nigeria, Ghana. Even 80 degrees Fahrenheit is a bit chilly to them. So I think even though the cold water in the baptistry will be cold, it's better than the river or the lake. So they're uh, looking forward to that. So that's from the Smith. Okay, let me double check. Is the microphone on both of them open? Not sure what that signal meant, but it sounds like it sounds like I'm getting two microphones. I don't know. So just use my wireless on me and for everybody else that this, I guess. I'm not sure that's happening. It just sounds strange to me. Maybe you're trying to keep me awake tonight. Okay, um, so real announcements here. Um, a college and career upcoming potluck this Sunday, and they're trying to put together seven care packages, and they'll be getting those out, and uh, those are always appreciated. Then the Children's Harvest Carnival coming up. See, Brother Guru, if you have questions, Dan the Carnival man himself is here tonight out of uniform. We'll find him. We'll find him. Okay. Then, again, if you're home educating, just a reminder, the Christian Educators Conference coming up, and we'll try to get a list of workshops out. And uh, then the Missions Conference, just kind of a, a calendar a note for you to save the dates. Uh, Wednesday through Sunday, November 9th through 13th, although nothing on Thursday night. Um, Dr. Bill Dillon, Brother Dave Kriegel. Um, missionaries to some countries that I try not to say online, uh, 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 live stream, so you know where they're from. Okay, um, keep all those in mind. Let's sing one more time if we could. But you know as the deer. Let's stand as we sing this. 
And let's sing it two times, 497, if you need your hymnal for that. Please be seated. Good. Thank you to, for, to the teens who volunteered to read some scripture in a little bit. And uh, thank you for being ready with that. And we'll look forward to your participating. Turn in your little workbook, if you would, to page number 15. Page 15, Money by the Book. Bible, Biblical Principles for You and Your Monies. And uh, that's the student guide. These are review questions from our study last week. Let's just kind of work through those quickly if we could. Uh, what two groups of people should give? Yes, sir. The rich and the poor implied and all in between, of course. Okay. Is it a sin to be rich? Whatever your answer is, explain your answer. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Could be sin depending on how you spend the money. What hard attitude? Dan, the carnival man, you keep moving around. He's bound to show up anywhere. Okay. Um, um, I rudely interrupted myself. Finish my question and give the answer. Is it a sin to be rich? Um, no. Oh, it's the hard attitude. It's the love of money that's problematic uh, to us. Uh, I've, kn I've known some people whom God blessed in marvelous ways who are really have been used to the Lord. And um, so uh, question three, what three things should believers give? Time. Good. Talents, offerings, okay. There are three things the book kind of highlighted. These other two are great, they're right, they're good. Time, talents, offerings. What are the other two? Yourself, tithes, good, okay. Self, tithes, offerings. Question four, summarize how we should give. In other words, give some synonyms to such words as purposefully, cheerfully, willingly, liberally, obediently, sacrificially, consistently. Okay, and then five, where should tithes and I'm going to change the question a little bit, uh, just based on um, kind of my, my own practice. And most of your offerings, 
go. Sure. Local church. What's the term used in Malachi? Storehouse. Okay. Storehouse. Okay, let's go to um, chapter number four. Um, give to God. Chapter three had to do with our motivation. Uh, excuse me, our method now comes to motivation. So kind of the key verse for this chapter, and let's read it aloud together. Reference, verse, and reference. Reference, Proverbs 3, 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with thy substance, and with the first fruits of all thine increase, so shall thy barns be filled with plenty. Proverbs 3, 9 and 10. Someone described the, the term first fruits. What's that all about? It's an agrarian term. Okay, from the from okay, from the top, from the gross. First of the best. Now when it comes to fruit, um, the the first may not always be the best, but it's the you know, it's what you've been looking forward to. I can remember going out in the strawberry field and hunting for a half ripe red strawberry, meaning the other half was green, and then we loved it. I don't recommend it, but um, first fruits. It's, it's much on that another time. All right. So why are we to give? Why are we to give? Um, giving should flow naturally from a thankful heart. And uh, if, um, if we don't have a thankful heart, we're probably not going not, not to uh, have a natural flow to our giving, just kind of looking for a way to be a blessing to folks. So let's consider a few reasons for giving uh, that will rekindle a heart of devotion to God and renew a motivation within us. So in your notes there, God, first of all, commands us to give. How many of you like commands? Well, I guess you would say it depends on what they are. If they're safety commands, bridge out ahead. Do not go any further. Does that sound like a command? Do not go any further. I don't think that's the way they write it, but uh, stop. Bridge out. Do not proceed, whatever. Uh, it's for our good. You know, a lot of times um, as as when we were children, our parents asked certain things of us. We didn't always understand it till we kind of got a little older and then it started to make sense. Oh, I see why, why uh, mom and dad said do this or don't do this. Someone wrote this, because God loves us, he would never require something of us that is not in our best interest. That's not always easy to keep in mind when you're going through the fire. I had someone... Um, one time, I'll put up my own words, say, man, it's just one medical matter after another. And, and it was. It was just unbelievable. And uh, what's next? Well, they were a person of faith, and they were, they were camping out on Hebrews chapter 11. Giving demonstrates our love for God. I think we have a teenager with 2 Corinthians 8.8. 8. Melody. Okay, that phrase, to prove the sincerity of your love. So what's the word prove mean? I think there's a blank in your book. To prove is to test or to show the reality of, um, show that it's true. Amy Carmichael, famous missionary, you cannot answer this, to our, our bookstore marm, she knows the answers to all these biographical questions. What country was she a missionary to? In, oh, you guys are good, India. She said this, you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. One more time, you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. So we need to make sure 
that we give to God because we love him and not merely because it is our duty. Then uh, giving demonstrates our, our love for God. Then, then uh, in that same verse that was just read, 2 Corinthians 8, 8, to prove our sincerity. Um, what's the synonym for sincerity? Genuineness. Authentic. Again, uh, meaningful from the heart. Um, the word love now is uh, uh, the next word, and it's the same word used to describe God's sacrificial love. I think you can quote this with me. Romans 5, 8. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's a good verse to memorize. Um, so... One of, one of the reasons that we give, of course, and, and people often give sacrificially, every once in a while there is a tray of cinnamon rolls that mysteriously shows up early in the morning in the media center before school starts. I'll tell you, it's not the church mouse cooking through the night. Somebody got up, I mean, they're still warm. Somebody got up early, sacrificially, to be a blessing to others. You know, I've never seen a note. I, so-and-so, got up at the crack of dawn to bless all of you hardworking staff. Sacrificial doesn't bring attention to themselves. So I'm going to ask you this question. How do we express our love uh, to others in the various relationships we have? Just a, just a general answer to Maybe not as specific, but how do you show your love? Yes, sir? Action. Okay, specific kinds of action would be a kind word. Yeah, buying things for somebody that they would never ask you for, you know, you'll... They like him, you go ahead and buy him sacrificially. So some kind of gift, uh, acts of service. I know some of you men, I'm sure, help out around the house. Load, unload the dishwasher. Do some laundry. Um, buy clothes that don't require ironing. <laughs> That's a blessing uh, to your wife. Uh, I haven't quite learned that one yet. Paul warned this. Uh, we got another teen that's going to read 1 Corinthians 13, uh, 3. He warned about trying to give without love by saying this. That's giving, isn't it? Bestowing all your goods to feed the poor, and though your body be burned, the scripture says... Um, if I have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. That is thought-provoking, isn't it? That's, that's kind of the opposite of giving grudgingly. Yeah, the Lord loveth a grudging, a cheerful giver. And then the Lord watches our giving. We're not going to review this, but last Sunday, just so happens that Mark chapter 12, we looked at the widow woman who gave two mites and... Uh, um, Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld. He watched. He looked. He noticed. And as he noticed this lady, he made some observations. So in your notes, he watches who gives? The rich, wanting to be seen of others. The poor, just giving sacrificially over means to God. He, and he watches how people give. Um, What's their motivation? What's their attitude? He sees what is given. Although rich people cast in much, and the widow, poor widow lady, gave um, of her two mites, Jesus said that she cast in more. That was his analysis. So I, I don't think this passage, some might teach this, but I don't think this passage is teaching 
that we should give all of our money. I mean, just every Sunday come and put your paycheck in the offering. I don't think it's teaching that. I think it's teaching that as we give, it's, it's the heart in the giving that the Lord really notices. George Mueller, another quote, uh, said this, God judges what we give by what we keep. It's kind of thought-provoking also, isn't it? And then giving brings joy. Uh, so many Bible principles um, are just the opposite of today's conventional thinking. I think we have another teen ready to read Acts 20 and verse 35. That, in, that last phrase, it is more blessed to give than to receive. If we had a little camera on all of you during gift exchanging times, I think you would pretty much see parents get a bigger kick out of giving things to their kids than kids um, maybe do receiving it. Why? Because you put thought into it. Um, you, you've picked out something that they, they need or they like, and there's joy in that. I want to read an illustration that the author of your study guide wrote, uh, and as you know, he was a missionary in Zambia 10, 11 years. He wrote this, as a missionary, I noticed that one of the churches we led had become seemingly very self-serving. I decided that all the offerings that we collected during one particular December would be targeted toward a missions project. As we challenged the members to think of others many began to give sacrificially. This was exemplified by one of the teens in our church. Though his mother had recently died, he was determined to find money to give. There were younger siblings in the house, a drunkard for a father. There was not much to spare. But as missionary Dave Olson writes, he found a way to contribute. The offering time at our church became a happy occasion as people eagerly gave to help others hear the gospel in another part of the world. We had set a goal of raising $100. But the people surpassed our expectations and gave $192. Now that was huge for them, almost double. Our people were thrilled that they had raised enough money to purchase 1,500 salvation marked Bible studies to send to another part of the world. It turned out to be the happiest December they'd ever experienced. Why? Let's say the end of that verse again. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Again, if we give out a duty, we're missing one of the greatest benefits of, of giving. Then God gives back. Said another way, we cannot outgive God ever. Now, don't give to get, and don't give and say, God, you still owe me. Uh, you know, don't keep a ledger for God. He, he'll, he'll take care of his side without us keeping track. So, God gives back to us. Let me ask you to turn to Philippians 4. And I'm keeping my eye on the clock because we want to get you teens to your. Your class are here for a good 30 minutes if we can. So Philippians 4, um, there's a well-known verse. Philippians 4.19, let's read it aloud together. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now, go back to verse number 3. So, so we find here, that, that many like to claim this verse when they're in trouble financially. Um, but earlier in the chapter, Paul highlights in several verses, three or four we'll look at, in which people were noted to have been giving. And that kind of leads up to verse 19. Let's look at those. Look at verse number three. I entreat the also true yoke fellow. Help those women 
which labored with me in the gospel, with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. So there were those who gave on themselves service, probably some material things. Look at, drop down to verse number 10. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. So they found ways to care for him, help him. Look at verse 14. Notwithstanding you have well done that ye did communicate with my affliction. Communication is more than just writing a note. It's, it's showing sometimes tangibly or praying or many ways. But he said, he said um, there in verse 14, you did communicate. You did meet my needs. Then one more, verse 15, and this is particularly powerful. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. They were a, they were a special church. Verse 14. Others didn't. You did, he says to these in Philippi. Who knows the name of the lady? I'm going to ask a teen to give this to me. Who knows the name of the lady who had the ladies group a meeting down by the riverside in Philippi. It's Acts chapter 16. The name of the lady. She may well have been one of those who helped because in light of her vocation, we think she was probably somewhat well-to-do. Do you want to know her name? Okay, we'll go to a post-teen. Lydia. She was a seller of purple, which was a very unique color for yarn in those days because the plant that it was extracted from, or the animal, I forget which one. Um, there is a difference. Um, uh, it was pretty rare. So he highlights these from Philippi. And then there's one more here, verse 18. I have all and abound. I'm full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you. What things? Maybe some non-perishable food items. Maybe some clothing. Maybe some money uh, to help um, provide for himself. All of that leads to verse 19. But my God shall supply all your need. Who's he writing to? Particularly these in Philippi. Now sometimes you and I may go to prayer and we say, Lord, could I borrow this, 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 this scripture and camp out on it for myself? Could this be true for me? My God shall supply your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So that's a, that's a wonderful section to contemplate. All right, so God gives back. Um, listen to Luke 6, 38. Give and it shall be given you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together. How many of you have a refuse bin that you put out one day a week for the garbage man to come and pick up? How many of you have more to go into that bin than you can ever get in it usually on any given week? How many of you get a, a safe way of standing up and jumping up and down on it so you can get more into, okay, good man, good man, oh, good lady, okay, good job. Yeah, I did that a while back and I wasn't safe and over everything went. The bin, myself, the stuff that I've been trying to tamp down. Oh, I wonder if my good wife would come hold my thing while I jump up and down on it. Press down is the point. In other words, it's, you get the idea that God's just looking for ways to give you more than maybe you, you would have had opportunity to receive it. With the same measure that you meet, with all it shall be measured to you again. When he loads your basket, he, he presses it down to make more room and then, and then adds more until it finally overflows. We have another teen with a scripture, Proverbs eleven twenty four.
It's a good scripture. There is that scattereth and yet increaseth. There is that withholdeth more than is meet or proper, but it tendeth to pro poverty. When we're, when we're generous, God seems to know who he can entrust more with. And uh, what a blessing that is. I want, I want to read another illustration from the mission field. Shortly after we returned from the mission field, this would be at the, uh, like the 10, 11 year mark when he became very, very ill and he had to come off the field and still struggling with that, by the way. He writes this, each year the members of our church pray and ask God to show how much they would give for the upcoming fiscal, fiscal year for the Faith Promise Annual Stewardship Banquet. I was unsure how much I could work because my, my health had drastically declined while living in Africa. At the time, we were still receiving monthly support from several churches, but I knew much of that support would drop. Just as a point of reference, um, recently one of the ladies on the mission field had a, her husband die, and they had been on the mission field most of their adult life. And uh, someone noted, maybe they asked her, hey, how are you doing? But churches fairly quickly s s dropped their support once he died. Now it's a challenge for churches to keep up with retired missionaries, to keep up with widows. But I'll tell you, as long as we can, we need to do our best to help the widows who remain on the mission field. And uh, I'm grateful for the missions uh, fellows who feel that way. And we've continued for many years now to support uh, Mrs. Weldon Jones' wife, Elaine, on the mission field as she continues to serve. So, um, and some do, some do not. But his point here was, God clearly challenged me to give a certain amount, even though I figured my support would start to drop. At the beginning of the year, our, uh, so he writes, for the next four months, we managed just fine. At the beginning of the year, um, our finances started to plummet dramatically. After giving God what we'd promised and paying our health insurance, we had $54 to carry us through until the next, next month's paycheck. My wife and I knew that it was right to, to, to keep our promise to God. After all, he said, given it shall be given you. My, my attitude, uh, frankly, was more like the man who approached Jesus saying, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. He's struggling. Thankfully, our Savior is faithful. Within a week or so, I received a check in the mail I was not expecting for $1,200. Boy, those are the kind of things you note in your prayer diary and you look back on. Wow, God is faithful. Okay, next. Our giving determines if souls go to hell or to heaven. Some churches have been called to reach out in a certain way. A church reached out where his wife-to-be was living as a little girl and got her to church, just as I think uh, there have been some who picked up others tonight, brought them to service. But uh, Dave Olson's wife, Lisa, was a little girl when she was, they started to bring her to church. And the result was her family got saved. She got to Bible college, and guess where she met her husband and then she became a missionary's wife. Um, another illustration. When my family arrived on the mission field, the life expectancy of the average Zambian was 35 years old. It's over 70, maybe 80-ish for us. Many people died before that age. He tells the story of a boy named Loy. It was a 13-year-old boy coming to church named Loy. One day, my wife was out soul winning and had come across Loy. He started speaking to her in the tribal language. At that time, my wife could only recognize one word in that language, the word Bible. At first, she thought he was asking for a Bible, as so many people do. The lady she was out with, though, did know the language and translated what he really said. He said... 
he was asking them to come by his house so they could teach him the Bible. They went, witness to him and his mother. Both prayed to receive Christ. Lloyd became very faithful to church, always had a sweet spirit. A couple of months later, he was baptized and um, kept growing. Within a couple of months, Lloyd got sick and less than a week later, he died. Normally, I do not enjoy preaching at funerals, but it was much easier to preach this time because of his testimony. About 200 people came from the town and heard a clear salvation testimony, partly because this boy had such a good testimony in the community. Here's the rest of the story. I wrote that incident in a prayer letter back in the year 2003. When he wrote that, he said, what I did not tell you was that we had raised our support to go to the mission field in what turned out to be record time as far as averages are concerned. Had we been on deputation twice that amount of time, like often is the case, Loy would have been dead long before we arrived. I'm glad people saw the need to give to the cause of missions. 3 John, verses 5 and 8. The apostle commends the believers for their sacrifice in helping those who are carrying the truth to the regions um, beyond. Listen to verse number 8 of 3 John. He, he says, uh, Paul relates, uh, calls them fellow helpers to the truth. In other words, Paul was helped by others who helped him to preach the gospel out there just as people, uh, you and I, help others go to other parts of the world and preach the gospel. Secondly, what hinders giving? Selfishness. Teens, one more verse here. Elizabeth, I think. Or that was you, maybe. No, Elizabeth, yeah. Luke 12? Do I, is it someone else? Eliana, sorry, sorry. Elizabeth already did hers. Thou fool! Why? He layeth up treasure for himself, is not rich toward God. So selfishness. What else hinders giving? Lack of a budget. Another one, debt. Here's a, here's a good quote. When a person is in debt, he should still tithe and give a small offering, but he is no longer able to give generously until he gets himself out of debt. I, I have a story I wish I had time to tell you, just highlighting that truth. We find no command in the Bible to go into debt in order to give, 2 Corinthians 8, 12. If there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. Another hindrance to giving is lack of faith. Without faith, Hebrews 11 says, it is impossible to please God. Number three, what happens if you fail to give? Well, there's results. Blessings are missed. Here's an epitaph from a tombstone, someone noted. What I spent, I lost. What I saved, I left. What I gave, I have. That's thought provoking. What I spent, I lost. What I saved, I left. What I gave, I have. And then in Malachi, a curse is given when we fail to give according to God's direction. I think our last teen here, Malachi 3 9, says. Verse 11 goes on to speak of how that curse. Uh, comes upon someone, the devourer is loose to collect which, which, that which we didn't give. All right. 
We're going to wrap this up and get you teens to your class and the rest of us to our prayer groups. Let's close in prayer. Lord, we thank you for these truths. Thank you for the fact that you have said, prove me now herewith, test me, see if these principles don't work out the way I say they will. Lord, we find they do. And thereby we have testimonies that bring joy and blessing and then can be used as an encouragement to others, highlighting you, not us, but others who are blessed by God. Thank you for this time together in Jesus' name.